On February 20th, 2003, hundreds of rock fans gathered at the station nightclub to see the band Great White. 30 seconds into their first song, a pyrotechnic display ignited the entire building into an unimaginable inferno. 100 people lost their lives that night. How did this happen? Who's responsible? That's today on Death in Entertainment. Live from Los Angeles. 911, what is your emergency? Here in Hollywood now. Two counts of murder, injury, and death. Oh my God! Shocking new details that has stunned the entertainment world. Um, this makes me a little nervous. The hair stood up on my arms. Just like in the movies. Ah! What do you call this thing anyway? Death in entertainment. Hello, 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 hey, everybody. Hey, hey now. Hey, boo -boo. Welcome. My name is Kyle Plouffe. My name is Mark Balcarin. And I'm Alejandro Dowling. And this episode is going to take us all the way to February 20th, 2003. The top books at the time. Uh, this just in by Bob Schieffer. That's a question mark I said that with. Schieffer. Schieffer. The CBS <laughs> news guy. Oh, Schaefer. Bob Schaefer. Bob yeah. Schaefer. Bob this Schaefer. just in. Yeah. He retired a few years ago, and he would do the meet the press style Sunday morning show for CBS. Yes. Yeah. Portrait of a Killer by Patricia Cornwell. Cornwell. And the other top book at this time was Atkins for Life by Robert C. Atkins, oh who God. died of a heart attack, I believe. Too much Atkins for this guy. But you can't blame the Atkins diet on that. I mean, a what lot, can you blame it on? Most people are. You can't blame the Astro World uh, trampling on it. Ridiculous. <laughs> no, you can't blame that. <laughs> the Atkins <laughs> diet for that. For yeah. his cardiac arrest. The Atkins diet was huge throughout the I late 90s and early 2000s. Oh, it really? kind of birthed the keto thing that we're doing yeah. now. It's yeah. all taken... Yeah, keto is pretty much Atkins. Yeah, just Stop new doing versions. Atkins. Yeah. But yeah, he sold a lot of books. Sure did. I bet that wasn't even his fifth. I bet that was probably his 10th book on the Atkins diet. Could be. That's so funny that <laughs> he makes this huge success with this book. He's dead like two years later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what year did he die? I'm looking it up Ooh, right that's now. That's another episode. We'll do the Atkins. <laughs> did he get to enjoy his Atkins fortune? Oh, he died in 2003. Shut what? up. Yeah, he died less than two months later, April 17, 2003. Oh, my God. Face down in a stake. He had a history of heart attack and congestive heart failure and was weighed 258 pounds at the time of death. Woof. <laughs> and people took this guy <laughs> seriously. Kyle is, is visibly giddy right now. I mean, we've <laughs> I never literally. seen him this happy before. Wow. That the Atkins guy is dead. I love myself a good con artist. I love yeah, it. You haven't yeah. been that giddy since <laughs> you heard about Simon Monjack's yeah. passing. Yeah. Fuck that guy for yeah, real. Yeah. Like it's a, um, he was not on the Atkins diet. No. <laughs> We're going with the music now. Number three, we got Bump, Bump, Bump by B2K and P. Diddy. Oh, you remember it. Everybody go bump, bump, bump. Yeah. Mesmerized by Ja Rule and Ashanti was number two. Ja Rule. And then All I Have by Jennifer Lopez and LL Cool J. All I have. Baby, you know. I liked her first, like when she first came out with the music stuff, and then it kind of faded for me. I, it was listenable. It wasn't like, you know. I don't know. Yeah, Mark was just jamming out to, yeah. waiting for tonight. Yeah, exactly. Whoa. Or that, no, that was later Bring stuff. No, she had that really moms. annoying one at first. It was like, if you have my love. You remember that? Yeah, that was a good song. Oh, my God. <laughs> Mark, I hated that song. Mark's in the shower. Just, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, Mark is lathering. Not yeah. If up. you had my love. <laughs> yeah. I'm in the tub and it's playing on the jukebox before, yeah. <laughs> before I throw it into the tub to kill myself. <laughs> You'd have to. That's the next Jenny, logical step. Jenny from the block is playing. Yeah. And, yeah. The boom box just goes right on the water. <laughs> <laughs> Top movies at the time. Ooh. Number three, Chicago. 
Chicago, oh, that, that title in town. Hey. Oh, I got problems with what I like. You know, the whole, the whole <laughs> that's, tune. That's Sinatra. <laughs> that wasn't even in that movie. Oh, okay. I don't even know. Jesus. How to lose a guy in 10 days. How do you? Number two. Kyle. <laughs> you sing Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> you lost Mark in a second. <laughs> yeah. You go, you go on the Atkins. He lost us with that <laughs> yeah. J-Lo shower scenario. You go on the Atkins <laughs> diet. It's true. How to lose a Atkins in 10 hey. days. Hey. <laughs> And the number one movie at this time, Ben Affleck, Can't See, Blind Guy, Jennifer Gardner. This might be where they have uh, met each other. Daredevil. 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 Wow. Yeah, yeah. When superhero movies were out of favor yeah. for the yeah. most part. And the movie wasn't very good, was it? Colin Farrell, no. stacked cast, in my opinion. Colin oh, for Farrell sure, yeah. was in it. As Michael Clark Duncan, before Clark he Duncan. died away. Oh, he died? Yeah. yeah. Oh, shit. <laughs> Years ago. ago. Yeah. <laughs> after dating Amorosa for a few weeks. Oh, God. <laughs> Anybody would die after that. I'd kill myself. <laughs> Andy was doing the Atkins dad, I heard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And listening to If You Had My Love in the yeah. bathtub. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I can say one thing to get us going. Yeah. Okay, yeah. This happened February 20th, 2003. And actually, it's kind of the crux of how this podcast started. Because oh, yeah, that's me and Alejandro, slightly, it was before the pandemic. We were working together. And I think when it I, was during the pandemic. Because was it? We, we had to eat our lunch oh, outside on our cars. We were eating lunch out of the back of my truck. That's very like uh, that was the, it was the pandemic because we you it's like a hometown story kind of thing you know yeah. like let me talk to you you know just a couple of guys on a flatbed of a truck yeah because well, you couldn't partners. eat inside the restaurant at yeah the time. yeah that is true I had just seen the station nightclub fire footage which I thought was like a news report when I clicked on it there wasn't like a trigger warning or anything saying like hey this is eighteen plus this footage scarred me so bad I had to talk to somebody about it and I watched it the day before so I just throw it up on him like holy shit I've seen this footage like it's really messing with my head and his eyes lit up no because I don't want to say like it. the station In nightclub a disturbing <laughs> way yeah <laughs> because but you I gotta had say also it. seen it that's why I was like oh yeah. I've seen that well that was crazy to us when we started talking about it because Alejandro's all the way in Wisconsin and like you yeah. couldn't get away from it in New England when it happened in 2003 oh, time. all exactly. over the local news and it just so happens I don't want to get ahead of any information yeah. but a local newscaster was actually the one owner. of the brothers of the owners he's also yeah. one of the owners yeah. of the station it's crazy it's just yeah to me it was just like I didn't know anyone outside of New England knew about this thing. Oh, it was and a national Alejandro story. in Wisconsin, like, knows it like the back of his hand. Yeah. Some hair. There's a few freckles. <laughs> oh, so, the skin is a little so, oily. Jeez, oh, Louise. my God. Back of my hand. Buddy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And with that said, let's go to February 20th, 2003. Thank you for that warm anecdote. To lead us into this. Warm, Jesus. So, West Warwick, Rhode Island. Do you guys have anything to say about this place? Any, any, uh, any I used to perform reference? at a comedy club inside of a showcase movie theater. It's the, a small town, the right? The Comedy Zone. They're a national chain up the East Coast and in the South. Yeah, yeah it's it like a small like city, like one of those like post-industrial kind of chittles. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, I guess it's pretty much the geographical center of the state. Oh, okay. And it is sense. the smallest state. Yeah, it's tiny. Now we get to the property at 211 Cowasset Avenue. How do you pronounce that? Oh, I don't Bostonians. know. Bostonians. Cohasset? Cowasset? Cohasset? It's C-O-W. Oh, C-O-W. Sounds like a Wisconsin kind of yeah, avenue. It does, Cohasset, yeah, Cohasset. Cohasset, Na Native American tribe or something. So that was during World War II at this location. It was a rowdy sailor's bar. Then a guy named Raymond Villanova bought the building in 1974. Mm -hmm. And turned it into an Italian restaurant, oh. which remained until 1982. Oh. And this guy was more interested in commercial real estate. So then he began renting to other entrepreneurs with as-is leases. So they couldn't do any construction? No. 
They just had to leave it as is. Like leave it as is. And there were a bunch of cheap, <laughs> cheap That's renovations. Brando's here, by the way. <laughs> cool at Brando. <laughs> yeah, the renovations were all cheap, and the club name was changed several times from Glenn's Pub to Cracker Jacks to the filling <laughs> station. <laughs> hey, you boys want to go to Cracker Jacks and hang out later? I'd go. <laughs> Crack- Meet me in the Cracker Jacks parking lot. <laughs> yeah. I'll fuck you up. <laughs> we'll sniff some glue outside. <laughs> then a guy named Howard Julian bought the filling station, as it was known, in 1995. And he inherited the name and all the clientele it was a bar, bar called the, and staff. The filling station? Yes. That's so funny. Get your fill. It's better than Cracker Jacks. Well, not much. <laughs> but it's on par. Actually, I like Cracker Jacks better. Yeah. yeah. It's more spunky. <laughs> so he's like Don Draper in the pitch meeting. <laughs> Got spunk, kid. I'm a dumb Don Draper. <laughs> yeah. And the filling station, dumb Draper, was located a hundred feet south of the home of a guy named Barry Warner, the neighbor from hell. He would frequently complain about the noise. Oh my god. But there probably was a lot of noise. Uh, he probably wasn't <laughs> he probably, wrong, but he, yeah, he, yeah, he made a wrong. big statement. I mean, he's living next to a bar. What do you want? Yeah. And so then this Howard Julian guy that bought the place, he screwed in plastic foam blocks to the walls of the drummer's alcove, and then he kept the backstage exit doors tightly shut to lessen the noise. To soundproof it. To, yeah. Yeah. And then the stage door, which is closest to this neighbor, Barry was actually two doors back to back. But what did Barry have? Like, it wasn't a resident. He had his own business. No, it was a residence. What? Yeah. (laughs) They had houses that close to the station. That's crazy. So that's why it was a major issue for the club, the noise. The zoning there is out of control. Oh, it's ridiculous. (laughs) Yeah. Should have never been designed (laughs) like that. That's that's Rhode Island for you. Yeah. You, you You know, you grease a couple palms, you get whatever you want. So this club venture failed for Howard Julian. He fell behind on rent, and then he still owed purchase money to the previous owner. So he's all sorts of he's not doing failure well. yeah. here. <laughs> he's in arrears financially yeah, wise with yeah. a capital F. He's fucked failure and with so a capital PH in yeah. March <laughs> two thousand. March two thousand. These brothers buy the station. Jeff and Mike Derdarian. Oh, these dirtbags. They paid $130,000 to Julian for the club. That's it? That's cheap. Then they're paying 3.5K rent every month to the Villanova guy that owned the property. Wait. Remember oh. Raymond Villanova had as his leases yeah. for this place? So, yeah, they're still paying him rent. Wait, so the, they're really just buying the, the liquor business. license kind yeah. of Yeah, that they're point, buying right? the business. The business, yeah. Because yeah. that's not really a great deal. Yeah, you don't I buy was, and rent. No. Yeah, I thought it was the building. I'm like, that's pretty good. Yeah, that would have been amazing. And it was a side hustle for these guys. It wasn't their main thing. Jeff Dedarian was a reporter for a Boston TV station. WHDH. WHDH. Oh, four? Seven. Seven. Okay, I was close. It was a number. WNBC. <laughs> WNBC. <laughs> and Mike Dedarian, other brother, he was an investor slash businessman who sold insurance. And he had more- <laughs> Nothing scummy sounding there at all. Right. And he had more personal wealth than Jeff. He was like a field reporter and like special uh, report guy. He wasn't the guy at the desk. Jeff Tadarian here at uh, Newbury Street. And apparently Mike, (laughs) the richer bro, liked to show off his wealth. And he owned and leased a Cessna 172 airplane, a 26-foot powerboat, and he drove a BMW while his wife drove a Mercedes. Hmm. Yeah. Nice lifestyle for this guy. Right. Be a shame if something happened to it. And then the brothers also bought a nearby gas station. Yeah, that's when you know you made it. You buy, <laughs> yeah, you buy a local They're gas buying station. All these, filling station. You a say. filling station. Yeah, is an actual <laughs> filling station they bought. So yeah, you were talking about Jeff being on WHDH. WHDH as a field reporter. Well, he did a story once called "In Case of Emergency." And it was about how to escape a building fire and the importance of smoke detectors. Quote from him, they're cheap, buy them, install them, Mm -hmm. unquote. 
And then another story about the flammability of these mattresses that had this certain type of foam. The same foam that he put all over his goddamn club. Well, it it was also grandfathered in, though. Some of that stuff was already in there from the previous Some of it, but they also put more in. I will explain that very soon. Okay, okay. And he referred to it as solid gasoline in the story, this foam. Yeah. Which he put all over the place in his own club. Yeah. Insane. And by the way, yeah, if I haven't made that clear, the station, as the name was changed to from the filling station, it's a nightclub, bar, divey place that would host rock concerts. And about once a month, they'd get a name act and the rest would be cover bands and other events they could run to make some money. It kind of sounds like the Stone Pony where Bruce Springsteen started in New Jersey. Like that kind of like... Probably very similar. That kind of like down and out, like shitty place near the shore. Yeah. Yeah. And a promotions executive at WHJY, he said of the station... It's the place where good bands go to die. <laughs> because it was a third rate concert. Yeah, venue. they're catching them on the way down is pretty much yeah. what's going on. Yeah, like no one <laughs> no one crushes a concert in Rhode Island's like, yeah, I think we're gonna make it. Yeah. <laughs> so the brothers were known for having shady business deals. One guy owned and operated the sound system that was at the station. And he charged the previous owner a rental and mixing fee for this system. Yeah. But he clashed with the Dardarians, and he left a note on the back of the final invoice with them, relaying how they had been rude and stiffed him 55 bucks. (laughs) And the note ended with, quote, as you said, you know very little about this biz. I agree. It shows. End quote. So, Brutal. yeah, I love people that just that go- guy also seems very petty. Yeah. Fifty five dollars. <laughs> like, yo, talk to them about it. And the brothers ended up framing the note and putting it in their office. This guy's just leaving passive aggressive notes. And Alejandro is the one talking me out of framing the worst review I ever got on TaskRabbit saying, don't do it. Wait, what? what? <laughs> oh, so you want to be in the same category as the Dedarian? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Multi murderers. Yeah. yeah. Club owners. Yes. Okay. <laughs> and get this. Get that on the record. Are you ready for this? Yeah. Let's Y'all go. ready for this? Dun, dun, dun. Dun, 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 dun. The note survived the fire. What? Wow. Yeah. Wow. That's like some businesses put their first dollar they've made. They put their purse, like, you know, someone shitting on them for doing a bad job. (laughs) The universe wanted everyone to remember that. And (laughs) so... me 55 bucks. (laughs) I got a note for you about you (laughs) stiffing me a couple bucks. So they were doing that to everyone. The bouncer at the club was paid a certain amount based on the level of attendance that night. (laughs) <laughs> and local bands were Invite often your friends. stiffed. Yeah, the local bands were complaining about not getting what they were promised. Yeah. And then this artist. We use an artist the, loosely here. The guy that painted the mural. Oh, okay. So he wasn't the side artist. of the yeah. building. Okay. He was only paid $600 when promised $750. So, <laughs> I love how it's like, they just nickel it's and dime? Peanuts. Yeah, it's okay, peanuts. but still, it, to their point, it's like, then give us the extra 150. It's just 150. That's what you promised. That, that's what I'm saying. Oh, yeah. Like, I, I wouldn't be. They're pissing people off for no reason. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's such little money that wouldn't break the bank at all. Yeah. Okay, now let's get into the club capacity. The legal occupancy with all tables removed could not exceed 404 people. Per the fire department? Yes. Yeah. But the brothers listed it as 550. And why would they do that, you think? They did that because then national acts like Great White, Eddie Money, Dead Kennedys, and Quiet Riot, they would all come play there then. Well, money. I love the Dead Kennedys on, and Quiet Riot be, no being in the same... I know, and Eddie Money. Eddie Money. (laughs) What's with Eddie Money? No one one fits here. So they were all promised a 500 plus capacity, and that was just a flat out lie. Wow. So that was a selling point. Yeah, a selling point. Yeah. And so the brothers were then pressured to correct the noise problems by this neighbor, Barry Warner. <laughs> this sounds like a fucking nightmare situation. Oh, it is. They're in over why their heads. Would, yeah, why would they get involved in fucking this? Fucking Barry. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. This is interesting, though. Listen to this. Warner then mentioned to them 
that he worked for American Foam and that installing polyurethane foam as insulation could be an option. Wow. They get the idea from the neighbor that's complaining about the noise. He so, probably knew what he was doing. So did he sell them some of this shit? Then? Oh, yeah, he did. So he made money off In this. buckets. The, so they then <laughs> make a deal. <laughs> Wheelbarrows of money. They make a deal to buy his foam in order to keep him happy and less likely to complain about the noise then. Wow. The brothers bought 1,000 square feet of corrugated foam sheets. Of solid gasoline. <laughs> he probably saw the news report and then got a job at this place specifically to get this foam and sell it to them so they would burn their own fucking place down. Wow. That, <laughs> wow. Kyle is really that's... getting crazy with connecting the dots here. That's a little yeah. much. but <laughs> Kyle's so... got a fucking aluminum foil on his head right now. <laughs> I'm approaching the court. Yeah, he's losing it. So they buy all this foam and the manager at the station glued all the sheets over the walls and ceiling of the west and south ends and then all the way to the bathrooms using Super 77 spray adhesive. That I mean, sounds like gas. I know. I was just gonna say that. <laughs> that just sounds. They just flammable. have chemicals. Like they're just putting more shit everywhere. Yeah. Sounds like a bad idea. And he even put it over the white foam blocks that already were there in the drummer's alcove that Julian had installed years earlier. Yep. So they're putting foam on top of foam. Foam on foam on foam. Yeah. And you then foam on foam? some of the foam blocks were then spray painted black yep. by the brothers. That's so gross. Because it would blend in more. These are the dumbest people ever. Yeah. This place looked like hell. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Even before the fire. Yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> it really did. I, yeah. I'm like, like, I would never step foot in this place. <laughs> Well, you're one of the Even lucky before ones. the fire. <laughs> <laughs> so all this talk of smoldering foam. Yeah. I think it's a good place to get into Great White. Sure. And their history. Oh, yeah. Great White, bad band. So Great White was formed by singer Jack Russell and guitarist Mark Kendall in 1978. They actually named him the Terrier after him. <laughs> yeah, I mean, what a ridiculous name! Yeah. I, I, you know, Mick Jagger but, is one thing, but Jack Russell. But that's you know they were taking that from other rock stars. You just make up your own fucking persona. But Bob a dog, Dylan, Bob Dylan, yeah, Jack Russell's dumb. But like, <laughs> they developed a following in Southern California in the early '80s, and on their third album, which was 1989's Twice Shy, they were certified double platinum. And their big single, Once Bitten, Twice Shy, oh, yeah. reached number five on the charts. And the video was played all over MTV at the time. Mm. Do we want to hear a little of it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, here we go. <laughs> Woo. Once Bitten, Twice Once Shy, baby. My, my, my. Once Bitten, Twice Shy, baby. All right. Who's going to see that shit? Yeah. Oh, come on. Anyway. December 30th at Whiskey A Good Luck. Besides us. <laughs> yeah, we're going. <laughs> it was a big There's going to be like 10 people there. It's going to be great. It's Whatever. And in 1990, Great White sold out the LA Forum and appeared on MTV Unplugged. Wow. Unfortunately for Mr. Russell and the band, it was all downhill from there. Yeah. And I do mean that. So like, okay, so they're they're on the cusp right here. Yeah. Of the end of, you know, glam rock and hair the metal, the hair metal and yeah. the nineties grunge For becoming sure. a thing, yep. which killed a lot of those hair metal bands. They're like two years away from them being just, you know, dinosaurs. Extinct. Yeah, absolutely. In 1996, Jack Russell sold the copyright interest in the band, and then Mark Kendall and two other members left in the year 2000. So he sold away all the rights to his own song. Yeah. That's so dumb. That sounds like a bad Coke deal or something. Like, yeah, he's he, that's he's a so drug dumb. addict and yeah. alcoholic. So I feel like, yeah, a, a bookie has a gun to his head while he's signing that. <laughs> <laughs> so after that, Jack Russell and Mark Kendall, the guitarist, both went on solo tours and had solo albums, but they were both a bust. 
So then they agreed to team up. Who saw that coming? For a tour of smaller <laughs> venues in 2002 and 2003, calling themselves Jack Russell's Great White. Not Great uh, White, but Jack Russell's Great White because they didn't have the rights. It's my Great White. You can't have it. White. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. This is so pathetic. This guy's <laughs> life is, is so sad. sad. Jack Russell's <laughs> yeah. Great White. <laughs> Not only is it a bad name, but it's his own shitty fake name in front of it, too. <laughs> It'd be <laughs> like you're going to see Steven Tyler's Aerosmith. Yeah. <laughs> it's so stupid. <laughs> <laughs> And so not to shock you, but this tour that they're planning in 2002, 2003 had a low budget. Mm -hmm. And the tour manager was a guy named Dan Beakley. And he had managed Wasp's tour in 2000. <laughs> the white Anglo-Saxons? <laughs> Protestants? So he's just doing all the saddest former 80s kind of like people in yeah. like rehashing their horrible careers. And this Beakley <laughs> guy, he would also operate the tour's only extravagance, the pyrotechnics, which consisted of flash pots, which are electrically triggered effects fountain of sparks that sort of thing yeah these kind of effects you know they work safely for big bands like kiss in large arenas but smaller bands started to adopt this effect for some reason to add a little more show to the show but, but let's be that... honest nobody going to these shows cares that much about some sparks flying they just want to see some live music yeah. and have yeah. a drink play the hits yeah play the hit yeah, <laughs> nobody's going to see the sparks. Is my point. Yeah, totally unnecessary. Yeah, just like the scene in the Twilight Zone with the helicopter. <laughs> so this incarnation, Jack Russell's Great White, had some new band members. So we have Jack Russell on vocals, Mark Kendall, the original member on lead guitar. We got Boston Terrier, a we guy named <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have a Shih Tzu on the <laughs> harmonica. <laughs> We get a Dotson uh, <laughs> playing the, the cymbals. And a bulldog just sitting at the end of the stage. <laughs> so we have Ty Longley on rhythm guitar, David Phyllis on bass, and Eric Powers on drums. And by the way, everyone but Jack Russell and Mark Kendall were hired as studio musicians. Mm. Did you know this was a thing? So he pays them as studio musicians, and they're not allowed to say that they're in the band Great White or talk about it. <laughs> yep. Nor do they get to share in the tour's profits because they're just paid. So they're just session paid per gig? Musicians. Per yeah. gig? They're salaried. Wow. Oh, that's As so session weird. musicians. The music business works so bizarre. Yeah, it's messed up. Yeah. By the way, it's Jack Russell's Great White that's going on tour this tour. Oh. oh really? Yeah. Interesting you just said that about Jack Russell's Great White because a lot of the fans referred to this version of the band as fake white. Hey, oh, shit. Not so great white. I yeah. like how people are just like throwing rocks at like other bad <laughs> bands. Too. I like, know. Like, it's even like Even the original bad one was also bad, but like, yeah, that's so funny. Or that people <laughs> care enough that... This isn't the real great white. Yeah, I was there when, when they first did Twice Bit and Was Shy, you know, like, at the forum. Yeah. And they unplugged. I was in the front row, man. Yeah. And that was, shit was real. Yeah. I, I mean, was in Santa Rosa when I saw him at fucking Johnny's Shit Club. Those are real uh, conversations that are happening in Warwick, Rhode Island, by the way. Yeah. In Weymouth, Massachusetts, we were at uh, a family cookout. And one thing I overheard was... Uh, I liked Elton John before he was gay. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> that sounds... So know, people have their opinions about music. That's like there. an icebreaker in Wayne. Yeah. <laughs> Which, not to blow his mind or anything, but that's impossible, I think, because yeah. he was always gay. Yeah, yeah, it might be. It's on its face, the most insane thing I've ever heard. <laughs> so this fake white tour... Started in Honolulu, Hawaii. Wow, that's actually a great place to start. It was three nights of small crowds. And then they went to Glendale Heights, Illinois, Ooh. where Beakley's <laughs> pyrotechnics were axed by the club manager. Smart people. So they were turned down at 
multiple clubs on this tour this for all over pyrotechnics. The place. They're yeah. going to Hawaii. Some they're... club owners knew the deal and were like, uh-uh, yeah. not happening here. Yeah. We have a brain. We're not going <laughs> to be lighting <laughs> this stuff inside. Yeah. yeah. And, of course, Beakley, the tour manager, never secured the proper permits, nor was he licensed, so he shouldn't have even been sold these pyrotechnics. But licensing goes state by state and, like, municipality and... But these were stage pyrotechnics. These weren't, like, stuff that you buy at a fireworks store. Yeah, okay. Then they went to Evansville, Indiana, which, you know, nothing great happened in Evansville, Indiana. It sounds like... Sounds like really bad, actually. The birth of the (laughs) KKK or something. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Good old days in Evansville. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. When things were right. Like the the next American Hitler was born. (laughs) (laughs) Or will be. So, and then in on February 18th, they (laughs) went to Bangor, Maine. Oh, what? (laughs) Yeah. The home of Stephen King. And played a small (laughs) sports bar. I mean, this tour is sad. It sounds like the sport, like they're doing. People probably told music them music while the game's yes, still going on. Yeah, say, it's like an open like, mic. Hey, keep it down. <laughs> yeah. Trying to watch the Celtics over yeah. here. Jack Terrier's fucking uh, Great White's trying to play over here. I'm trying to listen. To they have the pyrotechnic. Celt- what if the pyrotechnic still goes on? <laughs> they're watching the Patriots game. <laughs> And so at this appearance in Maine, Jack Russell went on the radio, one of the local radio stations, and he was promoting it, saying they had a new pyro guy and that he would be melting the show tonight. (laughs) That sounds bad. (laughs) Yeah, just a little bit. Yikes. So that's where Great White and the tour are at this time. Now, let's check in. They're about to go south. In many ways. Go Thank hell. you for the teaser. <laughs> now let's check in with the Didarian brothers. <laughs> we want to see what's up with them, right? What's up with them? Mike was going through a bitter divorce, and the brothers were trying to sell the station in 2002. Of course. But it fell through because they had signed a five-year lease with Triton Realty, which was owned by that Raymond Villanova guy who yeah. they're paying rent to. Villanova. <laughs> But they made a pre-purchase agreement with one buyer named Michael O'Connor, and he was interested in the station. So he gave them a $19,000 deposit and was going to purchase the entire business for $190,000. So they're making a profit so far. More than the 130. they, They still put all the insulation. It depends on what they put into it, too. So this is going down. And the brothers are about to be out of that biz. Wow. And so this Michael O'Connor, who's about to buy it, he decides, okay, he does all that, and he's going to visit the club on February 20th to see it in action. (gasps) Shut the fuck up. What? Yep. Shut up. That's how close they were to selling it. Wow. This albatross around their yeah. neck. The night of the Great White Show. The This guy the new, shows up. The prospective going, buyer. Prospective buyer, thank you. Visits the venue, gets a tour, and left early after he was satisfied with what he saw. Oh, Didn't my. stay to he, see Great God. White. The satisfied part is the bigger question. Yeah. <laughs> what was he satisfied with? I'm satisfied. He saw... A bunch of people having fun, drinking, spending lots of money, yeah, buying well, lots of booze. The station was a happening place. Everybody knew someone that was there. Yeah. Needless yeah. to say, that sale never went through. I can imagine. Pretty bold of the guy actually followed through with it after this. <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> the next morning, Michael O'Connor is like, you know what? I'm still going to buy it. You know, yeah. I thought about this, and I know there's a lot of baggage yeah. attached to this place, but I, I'm still in. Yeah, the other guy's like, so you said 190, right? <laughs> I've always wanted just a plot of land. <laughs> With 3,000 lawsuits. It's going to be an <laughs> outdoor venue now. Yeah. All right, so on the morning of February 20th, 2003, the day of the show, mm. Jack Russell is strolling around town that day. He's a man about town. 
He's like doing a montage around town, just yeah. like you know, throwing dollars around and pretty uh, much. Yeah, he invites several locals to be on his VIP guest list, which turns out it's the guest <laughs> list you don't want to be on. Yeah, but that's just celebrity barking. That's all that is. Oh Getting yeah, people yeah, to the that, show. Hey, uh, you know, uh, I got a list. The VIP. Yeah, everyone's <laughs> a VIP there. So he invited some housekeepers from the Fairfield Inn. Wow. Where he was staying. That's where I stayed. I'm not lying. In West Warwick? Yes. When you played the Comedy Zone. Wow. I did not know he stayed there. Wow. That only so the you're... top level entertainers in town. Yeah, goddamn right. <laughs> did you invite the housekeepers to your show? I fucked them. Oh. Okay. <laughs> well, that's <laughs> one Orgy. step better. Yeah, went, well, you're trying now with do Jack. Different Russell. direction there. <laughs> he also invited a group of construction workers who were eating at Denny's <laughs> where he was oh having my breakfast. God. <laughs> this and guy. He's like the Pied Piper, but you know, these <laughs> of people. Warwick, Rhode Island. <laughs> yeah, of Warwick, Rhode Island. <laughs> and then there were t- these two college DJs that wanted to do an interview with him, and then he granted their request. Come to the show. Yeah, and then after the interview, he put them on the guest list. Wow. I, who, I'd be wondering who in this town is not on the guest list. Yeah. You know. He even went to get a tattoo on the night of the concert. And then he invited everyone at the tattoo parlor to come to the show. <laughs> what the fuck? Yeah. And why is he getting a tattoo right before the show? Like, does he think something significant is going to happen that night? <laughs> he wants to commemorate. Yeah. It's so weird. What a weird night to have gotten a does tattoo. Does he do this at every venue? I don't think around so. Because he doesn't country? look like Pete Davidson or anything. He doesn't have that many tats. <laughs> I was wondering what you're really going yeah. with that. Yeah, he does not look like Pete Davidson, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> so he's inviting, yeah, everyone in town, basically. And this is kind of problematic because, as you remember, there's only a certain number of people that actually fit inside the club. 550. No. 404. That, yes. But it shouldn't have even been 404. You want to know how that happened? There's this guy, Dennis LaRoque. And his nickname was Rocky. Rock. Go get him, Rocky. <laughs> you know how we have a shit list getting started yeah, with yeah. these episodes? Is he going to be on the shit list? They actually, this episode is going to really The Dadarians are blow definitely up. on the shit yeah, list. Yeah, this is going to blow up the shit list. Because we have <laughs> the Dadarians are clearly on it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, we can talk about Jack Russell. But this Dennis LaRoque guy, definitely on it. So he was the fire marshal in charge of enforcing oh. the state fire code. And calculating the legal occupancy. Let me tell you something. Yeah, so the capacity went from 50 when it was a restaurant. 50. Kyle, you okay? <laughs> that was just, I mean, we, we know we have a master impressionist over here. You just said the words that Fire Marshal Bill said, <laughs> but you said it not even like Fire Marshal Bill at all. I know, I wasn't going to ask. <laughs> I just moved on. Like, Let me tell you something. <laughs> I I don't need to be distracted by that nonsense. <laughs> Let me tell you something. <laughs> Let me tell you something. Yeah, I'm going to tell you something now. I'm going to continue with this little story here. So the capacity went from 50. Can you react to this finally? You're supposed to go like, what? So the capacity went from 50 when it was a restaurant. 50. 50. Oh my God! All right, that you know you're overdoing. So four hundred. No, it was. Oh, that it, was real. Five. Yes, that was a real reaction. Yes, that was real. You were laying it on a little thick, I thought, but I'm literally okay, shocked. Okay, good, because that's what the reaction so I wanted. So four hundred and four. Did they yeah. get rid of the? But hold tables? on, hold on. Oh, now that I'm... was when it was a restaurant. Okay, and then it was changed to one sixty one eventually, and Why? then to two hundred and twenty five. When it's not a restaurant, they take out the tables and it's yeah. not the same space. I mean, it is the same space, but it doesn't have the same furniture, the same stuff in so it. So people yeah. just standing yeah. shoulder to shoulder. So 225, clubs. that's a healthy number for the club okay. as it is. But that 225 number keeps ballooning through the years. And in December of 1999, it went from 258 to 317 when they removed some more tables. Uh, I love a good odd number like that. I know. 317. God help you if there's 318 in here. And then the brothers asked for more capacity for big shows, so that's where it officially got changed to 404 occupancy. Wow. So the fire marshal okayed this, and he listed the entire building as standing room, Hmm. which was a complete lie. 
how can an entire building be standing room? Yeah. And so it shouldn't have been 404 even. But mm. not that that mattered. Jack Russell's inviting everyone in town. <laughs> and then the Dodarian brothers, if the show sold out, they didn't care. They would make you a new ticket right on the spot. They'd give you a business card and write admit four on it. Mm. So occupancy sold out. None of that stuff matters to them. Yeah. And but it was probably rare that they sold this place out. Even 400, no matter what. They, I, don't I don't know. It was pretty popular. Really? Yeah. yeah. It was like the Travis Scott Astro World. It was the Astro World of, of West Warwick that night. 2003 yeah. West Warwick. If you can compare that, I think <laughs> yeah. you can. So this Dennis Rocky LaRoque okay. claimed to never have noticed the flammable foam in the room. Hmm. Which, come on. Yeah. I've heard some BS in my day. So it's his job to inspect the entire room. Of before course. a show, before a show, just to make in sure. general, yeah. yeah, they have like the yearly checkups, yeah, and yeah. All so that he stuff. doesn't see this obvious foam on the walls. Okay, yeah, that's well, they were right. spray painted black. Uh huh. What? He's colorblind. Hey, he doesn't yeah. see color. <laughs> <laughs> all he saw was wall. He was in the bathroom the whole time. Yeah. He didn't yeah. see nothing. <laughs> So if this guy had done his job and enforced the right code, none of this would have happened. Well, come on. This is Rhode Island. You it's know, possible he was either, on the take. Either it's a payoff on the, on the take, take. Really? Yeah. Or just lazy. And you want to know why he, Equally was never, possible. why he was never criminally charged? Because they couldn't prove that he was acting in anything but good faith. Mm. Well, that's hard to prove. And the show itself, the cost of it was $17. Wait, what? The budget was seventeen. Stage, no, it cost seven. The ticket cost seventeen dollars oh. for everyone. General I'm, admission. I'm, yeah, I'm going now. I'm. We're done with La Roque. Okay. <laughs> we're done with the fire code. Now we're gonna get into the show. So the local bands that opened for Gray White were Trip and Fathead. Coming on, Fathead. <laughs> and they were done by ten thirty p.m. The local station, WHJY, was sponsoring the show, and they had this DJ named Dr. Metal. He took to the stage with other promoters to pump the crowd up and encourage Budweiser drinking, and then he was giving away <laughs> T-shirts. Budweiser drinking? Yeah, let me explain it. So <laughs> there, He was like, what's up? Yeah, these are the concert promoters. He's like the he hype works man. At, yeah, yeah, he works at the local radio station. He's like the Duff guy or something right. from, from Simpsons. Yeah, Dr. Duff Metal. Man. And Budweiser was an official sponsor of the show as well. Okay. And they were doing this promotion that night where they would bring fresh beer from the local plant. What's oh, that wow. called? Uh, I remember the Born on Dates? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, the That's Born it. on Date. Thank yeah. you. They did the Born on Date promotion that So it was that Born night on that day. That's so stupid. With Budweiser. Yeah. yeah. And I'm sure it tasted very different from the other Budweiser. This is definitely a Budweiser audience. I'm sure you mean that as a compliment. And I don't mean ours. I mean uh, Great White. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, our audience is more of a Miller yeah. High Life crowd, yeah. right? Bud Light, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you got this guy giving away T-shirts right before Great White takes the stage, whooping it up. Oh. And then the tour manager, Dan Beakley, places a wooden board on the floor with four clips. Attached is a single cardboard tube called a gerb. They took out gerbs. Is that short for what Richard Gere put up his ass? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> That's what similar. went into the tube. <laughs> he probably. If you don't have time to say gerbil. Just say gerb. Hey, and... can you put a gerb in that gerb in my ass? <laughs> yeah, let me get a gerb in my ass and uh, let me get uh, yeah two tacos, uh, a beer, <laughs> and a pretty woman. He would have felt more sensation <laughs> if he had used an actual gerb up there. <laughs> Get that thing lit, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so, no, a gerb is not a gerbil. It is not a sex toy of Richard Gere's. It is a device. <laughs> well, the Richard Gere, they're both the same thing. <laughs> yeah. It's a device that produces uh, a dense plume of sparks, and it doesn't have any post-burn ash. So it's very incendiary and done. Yes, exactly. So it burns quick. It doesn't leave a lot of shit in the air or something. Right. Yeah. And it is labeled as a 15 by 15, which means that it is going to shoot 15 feet in okay. the air and last for 15 seconds. It seems uh, like you need a big space for this. You need a bigger space than the station. We're going to need a bigger space. Yeah. Yeah. 
according to Rhode Island law, these gerbs have to be lit by licensed pyrotechnicians. And you need a permit from the town fire marshal. And then you have to have fire extinguishers nearby. Mm -hmm. None of which was the case with yeah. the station. Strike one, two, and three, four. And then you also have to provide demonstration. You need sprinklers to get approved. too. You need uh, yes. proper water sprinklers. Sprinklers would yeah. be nice. And oddly enough, the Derdarian brothers didn't have a problem with these pyrotechnics, but they did ban confetti from the club. What the <laughs> fuck? Because it's hard to clean up. Yeah. <laughs> like the silly string in Hollywood. Right? Yeah, yeah, remember that? That was your platform for yeah. running for mayor of uh, Hollywood. Yeah. <laughs> was no more silly string, which is, you know, that's all you need. That's yeah. all we need to clean up this town. So <laughs> to backtrack slightly from the night of the show, in Chicago, there was a crazy incident that happened at this club called E2. I remember this. There was a club stampede just days before the station that left 21 people dead. So Jeff Derdarian, the news reporter brother, had just recently started working at a different news station called WPRI Channel 12. The CBS affiliate. Okay. He was working for NBC in Boston. Gotcha. W NBC. W -A -N -B -C. And so now he's on <laughs> CBS. <laughs> CBS. <laughs> Who? And because of this club stampede that happened in Chicago, he decided that he was going to do a big story on club safety. So he had this guy named Brian Butler, who also worked at the news station, come to the show that night. And so Brian Butler was there with equipment from the station filming around the club. Mm. And before to the show how safety really worked. Yeah. They were basically getting B-roll footage of a nightclub for the story. Mm -hmm. Oh, it also promoted his own yeah, fucking nightclub. Exactly. Like, yeah. So at this point, now we're back on the night of the show. And the cameraman's there, did the B-roll footage, and the local bands played. Dr. Metal Dr. gave Metal. away T-shirts. Dr. Metal, <laughs> and you need a prescription for rock! He yelled at everyone to drink Budweiser, <laughs> and everyone was having a blast. And then at 11 p.m., Great White takes the stage. Great White. <sighs> at 11.04, Jack Russell. the stage lights go out. <laughs> and then at 11.05, Jack Russell comes on with the mic and he goes into a song called not Once Bitten, Twice Shy, but it's called Desert Moon. A B-side. And then Dan Beakley, the tour manager, now lights the pyrotechnics that he has set up. And within five seconds, there are small flames on the foam by the drummer's alcove. Yeah. At 15 seconds, the gerbs stop sparking, as promised. Per the 15 and 15? Yes. And by now, the flames are about a foot high. The band members start to notice that the foam on the sides of the stage have two feet tongues of flames. But Mark Kendall, the guitarist, and Jack Russell are still unaware of the fire and imminent danger. At 23 seconds, the flames cover the ceiling of the drummer's alcove. The crowd goes from festive to curious to horrified. At 26 seconds, smoke fills the cathedral ceiling above the dance floor and begins to billow down into the club. At 36 seconds, the stage door is wide open. Great White stops playing, finally, noticing the flames on the west wall. Well, that's not good. Yeah, and Jack Russell speaks into the microphone saying what Kyle just said. Wow, that's not good. The understatement of the century. Yeah. And then Jack Russell proceeds to throw his water bottle at the flames. Nice. Which is... The man tried. Yeah, it's like fighting a saber-toothed tiger with a toothpick. Yeah. You like that analogy? That's great. So at 50 seconds now, 5-0, that's when the fire alarm is triggered. Wow. And it's a loud horn. Strobe lights start flashing. It's like a pounding rhythm of doom, this fire alarm. It's like when the British, when like the Blitzkrieg were happening. Yeah, it's like what you imagine like... the apocalypse sounds like. Yeah. Or when the Russians are it's finally like, attacking. Yeah. Bat, yeah. Bat, yeah. Bat. Just awful. At 57 seconds, 
Beakley, the tour manager, who had been looking for a fire extinguisher since the flames ignited, he briefly jumps back on stage before leaving through the stage door Mm -hmm. to safety. And Brian Butler, the cameraman that Jeff Darian had filmed that night, he goes past the ticket desk and out through the front door. To yeah, safety. he makes to it safety. out to yeah. safety. Mm-hmm. And he's recording the whole time. He was one of the first people out. Was he? Yeah. yeah. And there's a wave of escaping patrons as the smoke is thickening. And it's hard to make sense of what's going on inside, but it's just a mass of desperate people trying to get out at this point. So that was 57 seconds. And anybody who didn't escape within 90 seconds stood little to no chance of survival. Think about that. 90 seconds. Yeah. The problem is all the other people in front of you. Yeah, you know, exactly. There's no safe way of getting everyone casually out of this building. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just like there's oh, it's it, not it set it up for it that. Like the stampede. Like- it's an absolute nightmare because we're probably going to get into this right now. But the Dadarians set up almost a house of horrors. If anyone needed to escape, there was very little chance of them being able to escape this place. Right. So the state building code required sprinklers in all places of public assembly that are occupied by more than 300 people. That's a requirement. Mm -hmm. How many people were at this show? Mm -hmm. A lot more than the capacity of 404. Yeah. But the reason they weren't is because of grandfathering, which is buildings constructed before the date of the sprinkler requirement were exempt unless they had undergone a change in use or occupancy. So that's how they skirted around this issue. Yeah. But you can be grandfathered in for even commercial use places like this that have yeah. that many people. Mm-hmm. That, that that is not that's unheard of. Bill Blumenreich, who owns the Wilbur Theater in Boston, tried to get away with that, but he bought the Wilbur Theater, screwed a bunch of people over. Of course. I heard this guy's a scumbag. Yeah. Didn't have the sprinklers. And then the people who were owed money from him called the fire department saying they don't have sprinklers. So the grand opening got canceled day of. <laughs> wow. But he's like, I'm grandfathered in. They go, no, you had a change of occupancy or change of ownership. Yeah. So, Thank God. Yeah. So the National Institute of Standards and Technology investigated the fire with computer simulations and full-scale mock-ups, both with and without sprinklers. In the version without sprinklers, temperatures exceeded 1,000 degrees Celsius in the dance floor area and 500 degrees Celsius in the main bar in less than two minutes. I believe 40 degrees Celsius is 100 degrees Fahrenheit. No, it's like 32 degrees difference. I don't know the breakdown. We're smart. 40 Celsius is 104 Fahrenheit. Oh, really? So 1,000 Celsius is yeah. like fucking a billion. Forget about it. Oh, yeah, you're done. Shit. Yeah. You're melting. Yeah. Holy fuck. See, I'm smart. In the other version, oh, in the model with the sprinklers, the fire was extinguished within two minutes. Really? Uh-huh. Wow. They fucked up. One thing you guys were talking about is... The craziness of exiting, yeah. getting through the door. Well, so many people, when they heard about this fire, they said, oh, gee, you know what? That wouldn't have been me. I would have been smart enough to leave. I would have yeah. been smart enough to find the exit. Every dude thinks they're like the smartest at like getting out of situations. But the reality is it's just there was no way to well, escape at a certain point. People were trying to crawl over other people, right? Yeah, and it was totally dependent on the luck of where you happened to be at the Ugh. time of this. It had nothing to do with who was wiser to escape. And what happened is there's four exits to the club, which is, I guess, okay on paper if you see a layout of the club. But the problem is the band door exit was, first of all, that's covered in flames by this point. Yeah. And it looks very treacherous to get through. But then there's two side exits. But those people don't really know about those exits. And... Here's how the main entrance was designed. You enter through these doors, and then there's a hallway that is angled downward. Mm -hmm. And you go down the hallway, and then there's the ticket booth and the entrance to the club. 
So it's a narrow walkway. So even worse on the way out. That is really good, though, if you're trying to stop people from sneaking in to see shows for free. Yeah. But that's horrible if you're trying to escape to safety. It was purposely bottlenecked. Yeah. And this was the main entrance that people knew to escape. The only entrance that they really knew to escape. The same entrance that they came through. But to play contrarian, uh, okay. it's to think of a movie theater. You know, they're purposely trying to stop people from sneaking in there, too. They kind of bottleneck in a lot of places also. Yeah. They're not safe either. <laughs> really? Just yeah. In general, most movie theaters are? Well, I always think that when I'm at the top row well, watching yeah. a movie. If there's a fire or a shooter. Yeah, it takes a while fun. to go down all those stairs. Yeah, that's true. I'm not trying to uh, advocate for the Dedarians or anyone. So all the people saying like, yeah, I, I would have gotten out like. Good luck, because yeah. you're trying to get through this narrow hallway where there's 50 people in front of you already sandwiched in. Yeah. Imagine you're behind someone trying to get out. The person in front of you trips and falls. You get run over, essentially, because the person in front of you tripped, and now you trip over them, and then the person behind yeah. you runs into you. That makes sense. And then there's this thing called the commitment phenomenon which is where an individual or group facing increasingly negative outcomes from a decision nevertheless continues the behavior instead of altering course. Mm. So it's kind of like, um, what is that, the, the Einstein thing? You know, Insanity is doing the same thing and over, over and over and, over, and, expecting, and expecting a different outcome. Yes. Mm. So I think that kind of plays into that also. Yeah. And in reference to the station... It applies to anybody that was committed to their escape route. There you go. That couldn't yeah. do it. That's exactly so it. So rather than try to like like a like a mouse or a rat go or someplace different, tr try to go into another area of the the maze. They just kept going in the same direction, right. thinking mm -hmm. they're going to get there. The front door is how we got in. That's the way we're getting out. Not only that, the dirty Dedarians on the shit list. They had a problem with people sneaking into their concerts. Oh, God. Uh, so they chain locked the side doors on either side. So what? people were trying to leave, but there were literally chains locking them to be able to not leave the side doors. This is true. Wait a sec. 100%. I don't know about that. <clears throat> That's 100% true. A 10 year um, retrospective on the station nightclub fire from Rolling Stone magazine talks about. Inside, a flashover spread rapidly among flammable foam used as insulation. Meanwhile, two of the four exits had been chained shut, and a bouncer initially forbade patrons from using the stage door, creating a bottleneck at the front door. Mm. They had a problem with people sneaking in, and they literally did chain a couple exits shut. But you're, you also, uh, we've talked about like the structural changes that were made, like one of the doors was cemented shut, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, there used to be more exits, and there used to be an exit by the bathroom, but that was since cemented shut. Mm. And Same the windows, with another one. which I was looking at, I was like, break the fucking windows, made of plexiglass, so people couldn't get out. Jesus. Like, if you were at, like, the first five rows, it could have been possible that if you jumped forward instead of going back towards... Mm -hmm. The backstage, even though there was a big fire there, you would have be had a better chance. You would have been chance. immediately outside. Immediately outside. Immediately. Right? Yeah, right next to the stage with that door. You'd be but outside people in a second. naturally think if you go back or something, you go where you're supposed to go. Yeah. That's yeah, what it is. To get away that's from That's what it. you're conditioned to, to go to. Yeah. That's what else happened with that stage door. Like I said, that's also where the fire was really developing. But even though it looked really dangerous, that was. The fastest the way to get way out. out. Yeah. You're like, there's less fire there. I'm going that direction. Yeah, exactly. You know, even though everyone's going there and it's fucking a nightmare. Yeah. And Kyle, you were talking about that Rolling Stone article yeah. that said the two side exit doors were supposedly chained up yes. by the Dedarians. Yeah. Either way, I think some people unchained it that worked there and some were able to get out mm. of those. But you had to know about it. Right. Well, I will say, like, they had probably as many exits as legally they had Four. to have open. Yeah, so that so what do they care about exactly. these other ones that are chained up? Sure they're chained up, but they don't want to have too many exits. Yeah. People coming and going, they probably have a lot of people sneaking in and shit. As is the case often with these disasters, the people that work there know the layout the best. So they have the best chance of getting out. And yeah. that was true for some of them. So But they're not guiding people out. You know that 
I don't know if that was the case here, but like not only not guiding them out, specifically not allowing them to leave. Really? Okay, yeah, let's talk about that now. So there was a club rule that said no one but the band was allowed to use the stage door. And, Just stupid motherfuckers. Like, and one of the victims, Mike Lenone, was grabbed by a bouncer and turned away at the stage door after the pyrotechnics were lit. He was already nervous, yeah. knew this was going yeah. south quick. Mm-hmm. And another survivor, Gina Russo, who has since become an advocate for burn victims and has spoken against the Dedarians and Jack Russell publicly, she said she was also turned away at the door. Just her, so stupid. Her and her boyfriend, and her boyfriend died in the fire. What was their oh reasoning? Th- there was a fucking fire happening. What the fuck they, are you talking about? But you're not the band. <laughs> it's yeah. 90 you know, seconds Jack Russell. here. Yeah. It was so fast. Some people were just stupidly complying to the normal club rules, not thinking in those first seconds. You not banned. They, <laughs> yeah, it's it's just insane. Moron. It's insane. Okay, moron. Yeah. And Gina ended up passing now, and she woke up 11 weeks later in a Boston hospital to learn that her boyfriend had been killed. Oh, my God. Well, they have a really good burn unit at Children's Hospital, so that's probably why they got them up there. And there's just multiple witnesses that say people were being turned away at that door. It's believed that no less than 462 people were inside the station at this time. And let's get to the video. Okay, which one? Footage? Yeah. Yeah, boy. Here is the footage that Brian Butler shot for the station. You can turn it, you can turn it way down because it's just yeah. background noise. So you see all those people? That This is the B-roll footage he was shooting before the show. And everyone in the crowd is very excited, as you can see. They totally are rocking out. Yeah. <laughs> Just looks like a normal happening guys, club. Guys having yeah. a good time here? Yeah. The Drinks are being served? Yeah. Everyone's enjoying themselves? Bad tip right there, in my opinion. Yeah. This woman's making a joke about a bad tip. Someone yeah. left, and she says, we're waiting patiently. It's going to be a great show. Yeah. And curiously enough, look, they're filming the exit sign in this B-roll footage very prominently, yep. which is It looks pretty ominous. well lit. Yeah. And this is near the front door, the people getting stamped. Okay, so now this is where Great White takes the stage. Oh, my God, I remember this. And yeah. you see This is the, on the news every day. Every yeah. day. They were just hammering yeah. it. Yeah, and you see all the sparks flying behind them. And we have fire. Yeah, so there's the fire. There's the first flames. Yeah, oh my God. How did this footage get out? The place is packed. This is the guy. This is Brian Butler, who is oh, yeah, from yeah, the Butler. news station filming footage for He's already Jeff moving Dedarian. back. He's oh, he knows. He knows. Yeah. He's immediately out of there. Yeah, the cameraman is just backing Bye-bye. out now. Concern about self preservation at this point. The band is jumping off stage now. That's, that's the fire where, alarm. And you could hear Jack Russell say, that's not good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now the fire alarm is going. Just, and it's not moving quick. It's not moving quick at all. And imagine being behind all those people. He was the this first person trying people. to go, and he's still stuck. Yeah. And so People you see, pushing, and now he's finally out the door now. Yeah, now the people are making their way towards the front. They could be moving quicker, but, you know... Uh, they're doing their best. I guess so. Yeah. Because, remember, at this door, you can only go left or right. There was no yeah. straight shot. And Brian Butler finally escapes out into the cold night. He goes around to the stage door, and you can just hear blood-curdling screams in the background. And when he looks inside, he just sees smoke coming out. Yeah, it's just flying out of there. And he asks, is anybody inside? And then he goes around to the side, and what you just saw there is someone jumping out the window. Yeah, you saw literally someone broke the atrium window and went through it and ran out, and you see him running to safety. And, and then are Bri- stuck. Yeah, and then Brian Butler now makes his way back to the front. Why doesn't he put the fucking camera down? I know. Just, like, help people and out. then you see people at the front now stuck in the entryway. Like, they're not moving. Totally stuck. Anywhere. Yeah. So from then on, the video, it's just 
more burning, more screaming. Yeah, and just it's horror. Absolute horror. But the majority of the people did get out, obviously. Yes. But like about a quarter of the people died. That were yeah. there that night. That's crazy. So that means three quarters survived. But some were like half stuck out the door, like they were just kind of almost out. Yeah, and they didn't survive. It was so hot that even though they could reach their arms out, the rest of their body was in this inferno. Oh, yeah. And Shit. bodies were being melded together oh because God. of the heat. Damn. That's why that's the footage I saw. I saw the whole thing. And then when me and Alejandro were having lunch, I like had to get it off my chest because it messed <laughs> yeah. me up so bad. Well, yeah. you guys were talking and about he, it. He was saying he's like that is one of the most fascinating pieces of media that exists. It is. Yeah, it definitely is. I think it's like so. something you'd see in like Russia or something. You're literally in the eye of the inferno. Like, yeah, yeah. documenting exactly how it happened, or just seeing like how quickly things can just really turn. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. It seems calm, 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 crazy, 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 insanity. I have a yeah. clip of him actually talking about it. There was no way to stop the fire once it started. No one had water. There was the crowd is at least 10 or 12 deep from where I was. When I turned around, some people were already trying to leave. And others were just sitting there going, yeah, that's great. And I remember that statement because I was like, this is not great. This is time to leave. You think? I went around back. There was no one coming out the back door anymore. Anybody inside? I kicked out a side window to try to get people out of there. One guy did crawl out. I went back around the front again, and that's when you saw people stacked on top of each other trying to get out of the front door. Then cameraman Brian Butler stopped taking pictures and started saving lives. Well, it's about fucking time. Yeah, and <laughs> that was a news report from the time. There's some updates on that. That's a little bit disputed. I don't think he put the camera down. Well, in his footage, he eventually sets the camera down and he makes a call to the station. Police station? Huh? You said he calls the station. What station? Oh, his boss at the news station. News sta okay. And so we can't wait to tell him all this juicy, gory. Yeah, he, he, he says, You need a live truck down here right now. There are multiple deaths in this thing. What a so that's what he actually said. I hate that guy. And he was sued later on because several people accused him of blocking their way out. Oh, that wow. he delayed. You know, that's their what I exit. thought when, when he came out of there and he was just like shooting instead of just. There were people pushing you, you him. You keep fucking, you keep going, buddy. Yeah. And you're in you're leading the way. way. Yeah. I, I mean, you can't see the other way, so you don't know if there's people blocking his way, but there were definitely people pushing him. You know what I'm going to say? <laughs> this guy's on my shit list. Yeah. He he's halfway and on he my shit list. And he definitely kept filming. Of course. And there's even a guy that runs out and it it's like a movie. It's like cartoonish. He's running out and the top of his body's on fire. His, his oh entire God. upper half. Mm -hmm. And he's running through the parking lot and he just films him. So What? Yes. Yeah. This guy's a fucking piece of shit. Yeah. Uh, maybe his producer's like, you're a piece of garbage too when he called them. Called you the want to know who his producer was? Who? Jeff Dadarian. What? Yeah. He's the one that brought him on that night. Yeah. What? Yes. D wait, did you miss that when I said that? Yeah, I did miss that when you said that. <laughs> I said that. it several times. Because he went to WPRI, which is Channel 12 They were uh, doing news. the B-roll footage for the, talking the about, story. Talking about how safety should be run at a club because the Chicago deaths. Oh, my God. Remember, filming a story I thought he was a Chicago. different local uh, news guy. No. Shit, that's crazy. Jeff Dedarian had him there that night filming yeah oh, so this... not only did the future buyer of this place who put a deposit down to buy the station nightclub show up that night and Happy leave night early of, night of his life yeah <laughs> they also had someone filming from the local providence cbs affiliate about how safety should be done at a nightclub the same night the cia was mm -hmm. in there yes too. They, yeah, yeah a lot of things were going on there yeah too. And Jack Russell got a tattoo earlier, right? <laughs> Crazy day. <laughs> Thank God. Flames. Really? That's not true. No, it's not oh, true. Shit. There's a ton of stories that come out from this night of tragedies and survival as well. Rob Feeney and Donna Mitchell were knocked over near the kitchen by a man engulfed in flames. And they eventually got out. And the Cormier family 
ignored the bouncer at the door that wasn't letting people out the stage door and got out to safety. Good. Yeah. I'm surprised everyone didn't ignore that yeah, guy. Yeah, fuck that guy. And then the dad of that family that got out to safety then patted one of the band members on the shoulder and said, nice show, man, to no laughter. Jesus Christ. Gallows humor at the worst time. Yeah. That's no time to tell a geener. Not, not at all. At least wait a couple hours. Yeah. You got to, you know, time your geeners out better. <laughs> and by the way, the bad bouncer who allegedly wasn't letting people out the stage door, he was later ID'd as a guy named Scott Vieira. And this Scott Vieira guy was a complete tool. He was on disability for, like, hurting his ankle once. Oh. That's a big New England thing. Yeah. I, I've told that story about the guy in Stop It Shop that threw all the... <laughs> All the empty um, uh, boxes. cardboard boxes in a room, and he and he laid himself at the bottom of it, and then he had his boss come in. And he said he fell from on top of these boxes or I'm something. Hurt. <laughs> oh my god! And he got like a, a big suit for like you know hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I can't yeah. work anymore. Maybe we're the idiots not doing that. I know Absolutely. it actually sounds like a good idea. Get some oxys, dog. <laughs> and so this guy would... <laughs> I'll negotiate for oxys. <laughs> He'd sit at home all day, and then he would work like events at the station for peanuts. Yeah. And he'd get free beer, and you get to meet the band. Yeah, and so he, he was taking his job very seriously, I guess, that night. Ugh. Wanted to keep the Dedarians happy. Fucking he, of loser. course, denied doing this. Yeah, of course. He's been ID'd by multiple people. <laughs> 24 people escaped through the stage door to safety, and only eight were non-band people. Jeez. Um, and then Tracy King, uh, one of the good bouncers. One of the good ones. This is, <laughs> this is though, really, what's the word I'm looking for? Probably not Heartwarming. Probably not, oh, I thought it was going to be happy, but maybe it is kind of like a, well, he's a silver lining. He was a hero. Okay. And it's he was throwing people out through the atrium window. Wow. But staying inside, throwing people out. This guy gave his life to save people. And they all remember his name. They told his brother, your brother Tracy saved our life that night. Holy they re shit. They remember him throwing them through the window. It's not just a legend that might have happened. Yeah. And he, the he smoke got it. to him yeah. eventually and he died. Fuck. And he could have gone out the atrium window anytime. Many times over. So Tracy King on the opposite of whatever our shit list would be. Yeah, yeah our good list. Good yeah. list. The nice list. Yeah. One of the session guitarists, Ty Longley, who was part of the band, but wasn't allowed to say he was actually playing with Great White. Naturally. He did not get out the stage door. And he ended up dying in the fire. Oh, he did? Yeah, so yeah. he was the only band member. I didn't know that anyone died. from the band died. Yep. I thought they all got off. So Alejandro has refuted this. I don't know if there's like specific documentation, but the rumor was that he he got out and then was like, fuck, I need my guitar and went back in. <laughs> what? But didn't you say that was false? Yes. What really happened was Ty Longley ran over to this other guy named Bill Long, who was the road manager of one of the opening acts. And then they together went towards the atrium. Long was later pulled to safety while Ty had gone another way. Wow. What I think happened, or what I think the reason is for this version that was created where Ty went back in to get his guitar is because it makes him sound stupid and callous. Even though he was a victim, there were a lot of victims' families that resented his name being in the same mm. sentence with all the other victims because he was part of the band. He was a perpetrator yeah. in their, their eyes, yeah. Uh, and I yeah. think that rumor must have been started by someone that wanted to give him a bad name. Yeah. yeah. Or My theory only. Or the, uh, the defense or something in a, a civil litigation. 
It does make them sound very dumb. Yeah. <laughs> it does. Some people hold on to their guitars like that. I'm not saying this guy did, but like that is a plausible lie to make up if you're trying to make it look like oh, yeah. he was at fault for his own death. It's like the Mama Cass ham sandwich thing. But there, yeah, there there must um, have been sandwich. insurance that was kind of like paid out the fucking nose for a lot of this shit. Yeah. And then other heroes were Seamus Horan and Rick Zanetti, who were part of the Denny's crew that were invited by Jack Russell. Really? They were pulling people out of the building through the windows and doors. Wow. And sometimes retrieving hair and clothing only instead Jesus of the person. Christ. That is just... They're melting. Terrifying. Yeah, awful. The bartender and then one of the shot girls with the Budweiser that was going around that night, they were escaping together, but then the bartender took a quick fatal detour to the club office instead. Fuck. And then another guy stumbled into the back storeroom, and he saw a few other people, including Dr. Metal. Oh, the radio man. guy that was giving from a, WHJY, the one that the was Bud giving Roger. away free yes. T-shirts before Great White took the stage. So he was hiding in the storeroom. And so then this guy saw that and he left and took a lucky turn to exit through the kitchen door. But Dr. Metal did not escape. Everyone in that storeroom died. Mm. And then reports from the front entrance, there was this guy that looked like a linebacker. He charged through everybody to get out. So he's not a hero. He's like George Costanza in that sign. <laughs> yeah. He knocks over the clown and the kids. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he's on our shit list. Ugh. And people fell down and were wedged like dominoes from the floor to the ceiling. Oh my and this God. is 90 seconds after ignition. And then one autopsy revealed that a girl asphyxiated to death in that crowd by the front door. Yeah, just like in a pile of people. Yeah, just yeah. couldn't breathe. And then another girl escaped, but then her best friend got left behind. So then the girl phoned her friend's husband to deliver the bad news that she died. But then the husband while on the call with her, got a call waiting from his wife, the girl's best friend, saying that she was alive. What the fuck? So they both ended up surviving. Oh. Wow. But the girl thought her friend had died, so was telling the husband. How so, quick is that call? Yeah, so he goes from thinking she's dead and then getting the call waiting from her being alive. That, to me, sounds like she wanted it to happen and she was... She's angling going for to this get guy. the husband. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So what are we doing tomorrow night? And then one oh woman yelled, God. I have children. Like she should be let out first. And it should be noted that 64 kids lost one or both parents that night. Wow. Wow. Jeez. Yeah, that's tragic. Man. And then there's a guy named Joe Christina who snapped a photo inside the station. And this photo is as fascinating as the Brian Butler footage. Kyle, do you want to pull up the photo? Yes. Is this it right here? Yeah. Wow. This person's just smoking a cigarette. Just look at this photo for a second. I'm going to guess that person didn't survive. It's Guy in the photo. Yeah, and the dude in the photo, it looks totally at ease. He's holding a drink in one hand, and he's got a lit cigarette in the other hand. Just yeah. chilling. And behind him, the stage is engulfed in glowing flames. You can see the speakers are just ripping with flames, and you can't see anything over his head or around just the flames that are on the speakers because it's filled with smoke, and he's just, eh. He's got his jacket around his arm. He's got a beer in his hand and a cigarette in the other, hanging out. And by the way, the guy in the picture was later identified as a guy named Jeff Rader. Oh, okay. And he had been trying to court this girl there that night, I believe, and was just out for a good time. And we don't know why he was so calm there. He didn't make so it he, out. He didn't make it out. No. Oh, jeez. And so Joe Christina, the guy that took the photo, he took it at the urging of his friend, Matthew Pickett. And Pickett had an audio recorder with him. And so he was recording the show that night to be like a bootleg that he was going to share afterwards. 
So why are they? Re- why do they want to record these horrible? Bi- like they just want to. Wow. They, they're just bootleggers. He just wanted a bootleg. Great white recording. Some people are just bootleggers. They yeah. just want to. Yeah. You know. They Rock just, and rollers. They want to document it. I guess. Yeah, of course. Yeah. They were whiteheads. <laughs> <laughs> and unfortunately, Pickett went a different direction than his friend Joe, and he did not make it out alive. But Joe, who took the photo, did make it out alive. And here's the really insane part. The recording device was found by Matthew Pickett's lifeless body the next day in the wreckage. Wait, so this whole fucking building is dust, basically, but they're able to find this recording yeah. right next to, like, this spe- basically a skeleton of this other guy. Yeah, and... It's the, intact? The victim's family gave the tape to an audio-video forensic specialist. And so after painstaking restoration, the tape was saved. On the tape was 15 minutes of conversation. And then you can hear the opening chords of Desert Moon by Great White. And a girl yells out, get out, fire. And then Matthew Pickett yells for his friend Joe Christina to take the photo. We actually have the audio of that. The picket audio? Yes. Oh, God. You can hear him telling him to take a photo. (sighs) Take a picture. (laughs) Joe, Joe, take a picture. And that's the picture that. That's the picture we were just looking at. Dennis Rader. Or Dennis Rader. Rader. Jeff Rader. Dennis Rader's the BTK killer, I think. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway. Yes, that's the picture of Jeff Rader. This is the this one guy. that he says, Joe, take a picture. That's the picture he took. Wow. wow. And then after that, though, the recording continued. And John Barilek, who wrote the, the fantastic book where I got a lot of this information called Killer Show about the Station Nightclub fire. He was one of the lawyers that helped victims' families get money. Mm-hmm. But in the process of all that, he listened to the tape in its entirety and he said that after the point where Pickett dies and it starts getting really bleak in there that it's the worst thing he's ever heard in his life oh i bet yeah. and that after listening to it he was bawling really yeah and he said just imagine the worst audio you can imagine. i don't want to listen to that but that is no. not available no, no it's not it's not available it's just private to him yeah okay it consisted of unanswered prayers Desperate calls for help. Sure. Yeah. yeah. People screaming, dying. Yeah. Oof. Well, they're just stuck right there. There's just a mound of people in front of them. They can't go anywhere. They're yeah. just waiting to, you know, be burned alive. A guy named Raul Mike Vargas was stuck under a human pile by the front door. And he survived in that pile 90 minutes before being pulled out. They have a video of him. He's like charred. When he gets wheeled out into an ambulance. Yeah. Jack Russell, remember him? Mm-hmm. He emerged later and asked firefighters if everyone had made it out all right in a daze. Oof. Similar to when Dorsey Wingo asked, where's Vic after well, yeah. the helicopter accident well, on Jack the Twilight Russell, Zone set? Jack Russell's probably shit-faced anyway at the concert, so he probably makes it out of there and just wonders... Yeah, he's probably blackout drunk as he's going on stage at 11 o'clock. Yeah. And at the, how did we say, the Kawaset? Sure. Nearby was the Kawaset Inn. Sharing Where the Kyle name with the street. With no, Fair- that was Fairfield. <laughs> that was Fairfield. <laughs> okay. But at the Kawaset Inn and restaurant across the street, they set up a field hospital there. Second degree burns in general hurt more than third degree burns because the nerves, the nerves are still alive. Yeah. yeah. So the people screaming were helped after the victims that were in shock. Mm-hmm. So this is a really chaotic yeah, atmosphere. My God. And 96 people died in the fire that night. Mm. And only four of 188 people who were transferred to hospitals died. So that made the That's total 100. A miracle. Yeah. And even 100, which is unlikely, too. Streaming up. Yeah, that's... Oof. And the rescue lasted only 40 minutes, but the recovery went from midnight to noon, and 31 bodies from the front hallway were carefully removed. Some had been fused together. Oh. Mm. 
some girls made small talk with Jack Russell in the parking lot. He bummed the smoke and said, if anyone died, I don't know what I'll do. <laughs> this guy is <laughs> a buffoon. Just... <laughs> yeah, and the security guards are like, hey, we pushed a bunch of people back in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and we actually have a clip of him at the time the next day. Yeah. This couple's son was so badly burned, his parents could barely look at him. I couldn't stand in it. I couldn't stay there. It's a terrible thing to say. <laughs> terrible. By mid-afternoon, as the death toll mounted, the finger pointing began. They should have known better. Band members were taking none of the Oh, yeah, I forgot about they checked with the club owners before using their pyrotechnic display. We never do anything without asking permission first. What? Especially something like that. And just last week, the owner of another nightclub in New Jersey confronted the band for doing the very same thing to him. Again, without ever informing him that fireworks would be used. His response? What the hell are you doing? You have to stop right now. We do not allow pyrotechnics. Wow. Yeah, so some people had the right idea. Jack Russell's clearly not taking any of the blame there, even though... He claims that they gave him permission at the club. Of course, the Dedarians say they never heard about the pyrotechnics. Well, but there know. must have been a manager on site that worked for the Dedarians who would be... Good. He was in the bathroom. Yeah, he was in the bathroom <laughs> with Spielberg. <laughs> yeah. I was in the bathroom with Spielberg. And what happened inside that made it so fast where, you know... The foam produced this rapid flame spread, and then there was a quick flashover, yeah. and then toxic and flammable gases were then released, mm -hmm. and then the dense smoke just grew more intense, and then the heat grew more hot. <laughs> That's crazy. And as it would hit the cold, brisk air outside, it turned to that black smoke. The yeah, flames. yeah, it was cold. Like there was snow all over the ground. Oh, it's freezing yeah. at that time. That was like yeah. a really cold February. I I think I remember. It was a cold February. It was a cold yeah. fucking February. <laughs> Michael was not allowed. <laughs> <laughs> and um, remember the bartender from that B roll footage? Mm -hmm. Her name was Dina DeMaio, and it was her thirtieth birthday that mm, night. Shit. And so now the Crown Plaza, another hotel, that ends up being turned into the Family Assistance Center. Mm. And that's where the medical examiner team completed all 96 autopsies in four days Jesus. and identified the victims in just five days. Over one third of the victims were identified by their tattoos, which were preserved on the dermis below the charred skin. <sighs> 20 victims had high levels of cyanide in their bodies from the polyurethane foam. Jesus. This professor named Richard Gould and other volunteers led this excavation team that dug through the debris about a week later. The temperature was still below freezing. And so this was the forensic archaeology recovery effort. It's a grim task. Yeah, well, that's crazy because, you know, like obviously 9-11, some things are just kind of burned beyond recognition, and it's really hard to verify that a person is dead or not. Yeah. yeah. And some items that were found were uh, a black glove with bone fragments, a baseball cap that said Baltimore pile driving, health club memberships, cranial fragments, a scalp with hair, jewelry, watch parts, cell phones, eyeglass frames, and most of these items were found by the front door. One cell phone had 19 messages from a relative asking, where are you? Are you okay? Oh, Fuck. shit. They were probably all Nokia brick phones, too. Yeah. 2003. Right. Playing a lot of snake. A lot of chingy. <laughs> Excuse me? <laughs> chingy. Was that the rapper? It was a rapper I actually really enjoy. <laughs> well, he has, Kyle had that as his uh, Not cell surprised. Phone. <laughs> At the Holiday Inn. <laughs> At the Fairfield Inn. Yeah, he's a ringtone rapper. Fuck yeah. <laughs> the, the 10 people in the storeroom, as I mentioned before, died from poisonous gases because it was untouched by fire. Wow. Um, and two empty fire extinguishers were found inside. After the operation... The team saw a mechanical grabber moving debris, and they spotted a gold necklace that one family had requested to find. Mm. 
So the tour manager, Dan Beakley, and Jack Russell both claimed they had permission to use the pyro. But Jeff Jodarian said pyro was never allowed in the club, even though there are multiple examples of flash pots, gerbs, and butane fire breathing gerbs in the history of this club. Hmm. And Wasp, which was the band that Beakley managed in 2000, they had a fiery cod piece. A cod piece that shot sparks. What's a cod piece? <laughs> a the dick piece? Yeah. Oh, like a dick piece? Yeah. Really? Kiss used to have a famous cod piece in their <laughs> <laughs> costumes. And so for Jeff Dardarian to say that it was never used at the club, that's a bit. Well, they're, they're, they're those people lie. that they're, we're never there. You know, we're very hands off owners. We don't see anything. Well, Jeff was there that night and escaped. And then Jeff claimed that he had denied Great White's use of pyro in 2000, even though their 2002 tour was the first one where they used pyro. Hmm. So there's another lie that Jeff said. And then there was a band called Human Clay, which was a tribute to Creed. (laughs) And they had used (laughs) awful gerbs at a New Year's Eve show. So the New Year's Eve heavy, before the he- station fire. Heavy yeah. gerb use going yes. on at this place. Two and a half months it's before. It's like Richard Gere's apartment over yeah, there. With gerb, so many gerbs. gerbs. Left and right, yeah. It's, you know, waist deep in gerbs. And so the club. Like swing a dead cat without hitting a gerb. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And in you case you were. Spit wo- without hitting a gerb. In case you were wondering, the club was 4,000 square feet. Single story. That's small. Triton Realty claimed they didn't know the station was turned into a full nightclub. That's the guy, you know, Raymond Villanova's company. Villanova. And Villanova (laughs) had transferred the family home into his wife's name. Then get out of here. And then Shell, the company, the big gas company, they stopped doing business with the brothers after this. So everyone is trying to run for cover because they don't want to be part of the lawsuit. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So and, everyone's detaching their name yep. from all this shit. And on the night of the fire, Michael Dedarian had been vacationing in Florida. He does pretty. So he was. He treats there. himself pretty well. It seems yeah, like. that's the rich nice one. Car. Remember, yeah, yeah. yeah. nice He's car, got some boats, insurance money, sketchy. And two years after the fire, the Dardarian brothers filed for bankruptcy, shielding their basic assets from creditors and victims of the fire. We ain't got no more monies. The only truthful person in this whole mess and in the aftermath was tour manager Dan Beakley. Yeah, he goes, I fucked up. Yeah, he took. The whole blame. Did He's the it? one that lit the gerbs. Oh, okay. And he pled guilty and said he'll never be able to forgive himself, so he doesn't understand how anyone else would be able to forgive Is him. Is he still alive? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He's he didn't serve very long, but he, he did he's basically time? in hiding now. Yeah. So the the three biggest public targets were obviously the Dedarian brothers, that fire inspector LaRoque, Rocky, Rock, and Jack Russell. LaRock. A grand jury convened, and the jurors heard over 100 witnesses, and this went on for 10 months on and off. In December of 2003, the grand jury voted to indict only three people, Dan, Beakley, and then Jeff and Michael Derdarian. Jack Russell got off scot-free. Of course. Even though he was the one running the show. He wanted the pyro. Jack Russell's great white. Yeah. Right. Well, he gave the judge a VIP ticket for his show that night. Maybe ah, that there happen. you go. Yeah. But then the it judge g- wouldn't be alive. <laughs> Maybe he he got a tattoo of the judge. <laughs> and each here def- come the judge. <laughs> here come the judge. <laughs> each defendant was charged with a hundred counts of involuntary manslaughter, criminal negligence, and a hundred counts of misdemeanor manslaughter. One for each person killed in the fire, and each count carried a maximum penalty of thirty years in prison. Man. And so this wasn't the worst nightclub fire in the area in history, though. That distinction goes to the Coconut Grove. Sure does. Where 492 patrons died in 1942. My grandmother was almost there, she told me. Mm. Really? It was in Boston, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That was a big one. That was crazy. Yeah. Yeah, It was like a, a very crazy building. The way it was built was that, like, you were going through this maze of a building and you were going into different vibes every room that you went into. Yeah. And so there was literally no way to get out. They're just caught in a labyrinth 
As yeah. soon as one room goes yeah. up, you're done. You're and totally that done. was started supposedly by one of the bus boys or something lighting a match and throwing it. Well, it's yeah. not about what that person does. It's about like all the materials and exactly. shit that everything it was, is made of. That's yeah. what they said, that it wasn't his fault because yeah. the building shouldn't have ignited that fast. Yeah. Just like the station shouldn't have. Yeah. Yeah. So some people say that it wasn't fair for Dan Beakley to take all of the blame. Yeah, because, because he was just working for Jack Russell. The way they created that building is crazy. Yeah, so in May 2006, Beakley changed his plea from not guilty to guilty, and there were some victim impact statements. One speaker per victim, five minutes. Wow, that must Over been, two days. Must have been wild. Yeah, and then Beakley spoke, and he was bawling in court and apologized. And he had written a personal letter to each member of the victim's families. He was sentenced to four years to serve and then three years of probation. Some families were outraged and also outraged that there ended up being no criminal trial. And in September of 2006, the judge announced that a plea agreement had been reached and that the terms were acceptable to the Dedarians and the court. Mm -hmm. This was done to avoid a lengthy, costly, and heart-rending trial whose outcome was uncertain. That was what the court said about it, the mm -hmm. judge. But still, people wanted a trial. Yeah. They wanted a trial. Yeah. yeah account they wanted accountability. And then on September 29th, 2006, there were some more victim impact statements for the Dardarians. And let's hear one of the victims. This isn't in court, but this is from a documentary that Gina Russo helped produce. Joe Kynan? A, a, yeah, about the station survivors. While there was an intermission, we worked our way to the front. They started playing. They, they lit the sparkler things, and a few seconds later, there was flame. So Joe um, Kynan was a survivor. <laughs> We started taking off to get out, but because we were so far forward, by the time we got halfway out of the building, everyone else realized it at the same time too, so that's where the bottleneck came into play. Some folks in front of me fell down, and so with the push, everyone else started to fall down too, so I fell, my friend fell, I remember going black, and I'll look cries and calls for help and the screaming. And then a little less and a little less until it was pretty much just me. Fuck. Yeah, and Joe Kinnan was disfigured from yeah, he his looks injuries. Yeah, like he had some burns and stuff. But is a survivor and married man, started a family Not since good. then. Oh. One of the many inspiring people that came from that. Yeah. yeah. So the Dedarians then were sentenced and Jeff made a statement, which is through a long list of mistakes, including our own, this tragedy occurred. We realized the business we owned has caused so much heartache and loss. There are many days when I wish I didn't make it out of that building, because if I didn't, maybe some families would feel better to these families. I'm sorry that I did make it out. I know you would have liked it if I died, too. He's kind of gaslighting. You know? Yeah, like that's not, you know playing maybe the a victim. bad term to use here yeah. in this respect, but like oh come on, and all, then immediately <laughs> after that, he's like, if you don't accept that, I'm too pretty to go to jail. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can't go to jail. <laughs> I'm fresh paint. <laughs> yeah. And then regarding the he foam, didn't. I won't survive. Regarding the foam, he said, "I wish I knew how deadly and toxic it really was." Said the guy that did that news piece. He did a whole report. Solid gasoline years earlier. Yeah. yeah. And then Michael said, I just want to say how deeply sorry I am for the role I played in this tragedy. We fully accept as business owners that we should not have relied on other people. Little. Yeah. Oh, my God. Little so they get get everyone. Yeah, they're passing the blame off to of everyone else but themselves. You think they're going to accept it? And the brothers changed their pleas from guilty to no contest. And Michael got the same sentence as Beakley. Jeff's prison sentence was suspended. Jeff is the only one who didn't go to prison. Yeah, he got 500 hours of community service instead, which it's a walk. 
Yeah. And yeah. they decided that Michael should be the one to go to jail because Jeff had young children. I got kids. And then tour manager Dan Beakley was paroled after serving just 16 months. And then Michael was paroled after serving 27 months. Yeah. And then Jeff obviously never had to serve and just did the community service. And then Jack Russell and Dennis LaRoque, Rocky, the shitty fire marshal, never charged. Ridiculous. And never crazy penalized in any way? No. No. Never. So, wait, the same guy who was the lead singer of this band on this night is going to be at the Whiskey A Go-Go next month. Yes. Yes. And he's still going. Yeah. That is and wild. Still labeling it Jack Russell's great wife. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that is the and he, thing. That's crazy. In 2006, Jack Russell was profiled by the show Extra, getting a facelift to feel better. Wow. And we have another clip of him. What do I remember? Every, I remember every single thing. You know what I mean? I don't really want to get into the people screaming. You want, you want to hear about all that? People burning up to death. You want to hear about that? Yeah, you know, everybody tried to blame it on the band. I don't really think it was the band's fault. You had a show to do. You know what you were you were oh, doing. Please. But, uh, you know, was, you were obviously, you were on stage playing, and then all of a sudden you see a fire. Did this you just get out right nuts. away, or you just hung yeah. around? Yeah, I mean, I, well, actually, I'd grab, I, I looked around for a fire They're extinguisher and couldn't find one. Apparently, they had, it was broken. It was in a closet. And for some reason, the, the stage manager, after the thing happened, or, or when it happened, he went out and threw it out in the woods. Okay. Why? Why would you? Don't Sounds like a wild tale. Uh, so I, I had my water bottle, and you see me in the video. I was just trying to throw up there, and I was like, you know, there's oh no God. chance I was going to put it out. The thing is that when something like that happens, you know, people don't, people always have to have something to blame. I mean, there's still people out there that think I murdered their kids, you know, and, and that's horrible to live with. I mean, you know, I know better, but I mean, if that makes them feel better, I, you know, I guess I have to handle that. <laughs> What yeah. a clown. I know. It's like, oh my God. Buffoon. And taking no responsibility. It was his idea to have the pyrotechnics. Yeah. Yeah. And now we get to the civil cases. Because the criminal prosecution had been so disappointing for the victims' families, they were relying on the civil cases to bring some justice. And the author of the book, Killer Show, who I mentioned earlier, he talks about it here in a clip. There was great pressure on civil litigators like myself and the other members of the plaintiff steering committee to try to bring about a result that would shed some light on what happened here and bring a more substantial feeling of complete justice to the community. Except we had a strategic problem for the civil cases. And that was that the most clearly culpable defendants, specifically the band and the club owners, and even the town of West Warwick had no substantial assets. So as plaintiff's tort lawyers, we were pressed into doing something that if you believe in the tort system and the civil justice system and its importance in driving good behaviors, you find fine. If you're on the other side of the bar, you might find anathema. But that is, we had to develop theories of liability against much less obviously culpable defendants. So that's legalese for everyone responsible was a shit bum. Well, yeah, (laughs) exactly. It's so funny. That's so, uh, like, well, the town of, uh, the entire state of Rhode Island is basically bankrupt. Like, <laughs> yeah. I, I think I'd known that before. I'd heard stuff like, you know, they have no money. Their pensions have run the entire state, towns, cities, everything bankrupt. Wow. So by February 2006, it was getting to crunch time before the statute of limitations would run out. Yeah. They reconstructed the west end of the station in an evidence warehouse, and they tested foam remnants, studied hundreds of photos, and analyzed the Brian Butler video frame by frame. And so there were in total 467 plaintiffs against 87 individual corporate defendants. Wow. And one of the defendants, as I mentioned earlier, was Brian Butler, who shot the video. The news station that he worked for was one of the first parties to pay out, and it was in the millions. Wow. And then WHJY, the radio station that promoted the show, where Dr. Metal worked, 
the guy who died in the storeroom, their parent was Clear Channel. By 2008, the settlements had been made with almost all of the defendants, totaling $151 million. But then further exploration was made into this sealed air foam, which was the foam that Howard Julian installed in 1996. And they were able to find the manufacturer of that foam. And so they added another $25 million onto the settlement, Shit. making the final total $176 million. That's some good mm. legal work there. Absolutely. It's so impressive. And that's all John Baralik, the guy that we just heard yeah, talk. That's yeah, crazy. he was the head of that process. Wow. Yeah. That's the most impressive one to me, that Howard Julian's foam, the former owner, because that guy was no help to investigators because he saw that the Dardarians were in trouble. Mm -hmm. So then he was like, I don't remember where I got the foam. It was later found out that he found the foam in the garbage and pulled wow. it out to put in the club. Oh, <laughs> yeah. what? Yeah. Wow. And they just, through research and market analysis and studying the foam, they were able to find who the manufacturer yeah. was. Holy so it's God. really incredible. And again, they got to pay those people that do come up with that research and stuff, but that's great. Yeah, and even Budweiser had to pay out because... The Duffman guy. Yeah, they were <laughs> promoting the show, and they should have known that pyrotechnics were being used on Great White's tour, so why were True. they involved in promoting Great White's show? Yeah. So they got everybody they could involved in this settlement. Wow. Yeah. And after this, laws changed. There was no more grandfathering. And sprinklers were required in all places with 300 plus capacity. Mm. And remember Barry Warner, who sold the Dedarians the foam, the neighbor who complained about the noise? Yeah. Uh, what happened to him? It came out recently that he had sent a letter to the court alleging that the company should have had warnings with the foam and that it was sold as just soundproof foam. Okay. So it basically helped out the Dedarian's case because they claimed they didn't know it was dangerous. Uh, so Barry Warner's letter was claiming that the company didn't properly warn. But that's something that came out recently, and the Dedarians are talking about it now, and that this piece of evidence was never presented in court. First wow. of all, there was no trial anyway, and would it have made a difference? I don't know. 48 Hours did a... Like a follow -up segment piece. on yeah. the station two weeks ago. And for the first time, the Dedarians are speaking out to clear their name. Wow. And I have a clip. Oh, my God. Let's see this. One of the survivors in the special is a woman named Linda Saran, and she still blames the Dedarian brothers. If they stood up and said, small business owners... We were inexperienced. We took shortcuts. We screwed up. I would forgive them in a heartbeat. To people who feel that the two of you have never said, we own this, what do you say? We say that we're sorry for all of it, and if we could change it, we would. You know, a day doesn't go by that we don't think about it in some way, shape, or form. So to the people who think we don't own it, I'm telling you, we do own it. Okay, yeah. we own it every day. We, we own it every day. Does that so, mean you feel a sense of responsibility? We feel a sense of guilt about what happened ah. in the sense that you you carry the guilt of knowing that these people aren't here anymore and these people are hurt for the rest of their life. There isn't a guilt in terms of like that we knowingly did this or 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 you know caused it wow but there's a guilt you that, have responsibility we, for people it happened, on, a on, our watch. Like happened on our watch as a human being how do you not feel some sort of responsibility for that wow so what do you guys think very, of their apology there's still that that's a non-apology very delicately using their wording there and, yeah and the one from channel seven was the more slick one there you know yeah exactly the other one mike goes like we didn't mean to do nothing. <laughs> yeah. The rich one. <laughs> yeah, the rich one. Yeah. It seems like they're legally protecting themselves. Even if they wanted to say, you know, this is all our fault. We feel horrible about it. They still are like, we think about it every day. They're yeah. in our thoughts. Do we think about it? Sure. Every day. We're sending them you thoughts betcha. and prayers. Yeah. Send like, them some money, you pieces of shit. Yeah. <laughs> what money? They, they don't have Oh, yeah. Money, they're right? bankrupt. Yeah. Yeah. It's all on the Cayman Islands. 
Yeah. The money's in the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In 2017, the Station Nightclub Memorial Park opened up. So yeah. it's like a, like something to commemorate, you know, what happened. There. Yeah, it has each victim like has the nine eleven has a memorial. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah, with yeah. their picture on it. Mm. Wow, it's very nice. Yeah, and Jack Russell is still hated by most of the victims' families. Well, yeah. you guys should try to interview. We'll him. go tell him. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> go talk to him. And here, play that last clip of him. <laughs> It'll be 13 years in February. Almost unreal to station nightclub survivor Mike Riccardi. Is it something you think about every day? Every day, yeah. The Worcester native was at the Great White Show that night to interview frontman Jack Russell for his Nichols College radio show. His co-host, friend, and fellow student Jim Gahan by his side. He was a huge Great White fan, so he really was looking forward to this more than anybody. Seconds into the show, pyrotechnics caught the stage on fire. Riccardi made it out with second-degree burns. Gayen died just steps from the door. Over the years, Riccardi has processed the pain. He even published a book about it this summer. So he, for one, was ready to hear today's news that Jack Russell is sorry. I feel a guilt. I have this survivor's guilt. You yeah. Know, like, you know, why why did I get to live when so many other people didn't? So yeah, when I saw I the face of Jack Russell, <laughs> yeah, I didn't see the like man that. who fronted a rock band whose pyro killed 100 people. I saw the man who sat down with me and Jim Gay in that night and gave us an interview, gave us free tickets, helped two kids that were chasing a rock and roll dream. But he understands plenty of other survivors and victims' families disagree. Every time he speaks and brings up the station, it just hurts the families more and more. That's it's Tina Russo. 13 years to say I'm sorry. Too little, too late, Jack. Tracy and King's I'm not brother. absolving him yep. of everything that happened, but I'll always have a different opinion because of what he did for us. Russell says his formal apology will come in a documentary film he's making about the station nightclub fire never coming and out. how it affected his life. Yeah, that will never see the never, light of day. Yeah. Yeah. Where do we end here? <laughs> we uh, end with a lot of more people on the shit list for sure. Yeah. <laughs> this shit list is way too big now. Yeah. yeah. This From is this episode be a alone. Microsoft Access database. This shit list <laughs> is so big. There were a lot of things that led to this tragedy. Yeah. A lot of mini failures. Uh, on the way to a massive failure. And people were just out, you know, looking for a good time, having some beers. Thursday night. In trying February. To, some of them were going to get too drunk, bang into work the next day. Yep. Trying to escape the misery yeah. of Warwick. West, West Warwick. <laughs> yeah. And it's just too bad it wasn't a better band in their final moments. Yeah, yeah, Jesus. It's not high on my list of ways to die listening to Great White. No. Yeah. No, it's uh, very far down. Or being burned. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or if, it's, being... if it's even on the list, that's that's kind of crazy also. It's number 10. <laughs> yeah, number 10. <laughs> Final thoughts on the station nightclub. This has been a, it's, it's from been your guys' a, quite a road here. neck of yeah, the woods. Quite a, quite a ride. It brought back a lot of um, imagery, and they replayed that footage over and over and over, so yeah. it's, it's pretty crazy seeing it again. All right, well, <laughs> thank you all for listening. Yeah. Be sure to follow us on Twitter, Instagram, Instagram, YouTube. Yeah, YouTube is hot. Hot. I didn't mean that. Like YouTube is doing well. It's on. Yeah, our yeah. YouTube channel is sizzling. I mean, Good okay. God. <laughs> our YouTube channel is fire. Oh. I God. mean, oh, I meant like F Y R E. Okay. Kyle's right. walked out of the room. Yeah, I'm gone. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's Until it. next week. Goodbye. Bye bye. You have just heard a true Hollywood murder mystery. I have never seen anything like this before. The movies, Broadway, music, television, all of it. A place that manufactures nightmares. Okay, everybody, that's a wrap. Good night. Please drive home carefully and come back again soon.